Hello everyone, this is my first work in some time. There's not much to watch here. This vid will just be me rambling for a bit and then reading an old short story I wrote a long time ago. If you feel like it, feel free to just click off and listen to this video as I go on this bit of a rant and then read you this story. First off, I'd like to thank all of the new arrivals for subscribing following the interview I did with Azeal over VR chat back in November. Uh, your many kind words in the comments of that video and the recent ones and the many older vids that I've done in the past, uh, they warmed my blackened heart something fierce. If you've not seen that video, a link will be in the description. I wish I could say that I'm doing well, but unfortunately that would be a lie. I'm currently unemployed, my best laid plans for getting out of the security field were all for naught, and I've decided to take the next month or two off. It will cut into my savings, but I feel like the break from life and stress of the rat race will do me some good. I still need something to do, however, so I've decided to start recording the backlogs of my many short stories and upload them here. Nothing else on the docket, really. My boyfriend has encouraged me to start streaming again, perhaps to rekindle the spark of my dream to become an entertainer, but I'm not sure what to do or if there's anyone even willing to watch out there anymore. If you're interested... Leave a comment. Maybe I'll listen to you. I have an affiliate level Twitch account, so why not dust that off and try again on Lost Dreams? My recent firing, I've once again fallen into a tailspin of depression. On top of the PTSD, it's not doing me any favors. With the loss of my health insurance, I can no longer visit my current counselor. I'd pay out of pocket, but I'd be broke faster than I'd care to admit if I did that. Also, unfortunately, I don't qualify for unemployment in my home state, so that's more bad news. As, sing with a, as a single man with no dependents, uh, this state I call home has pretty much told me to go sit and spin. It's not all bad, though. I'm alive. Got a new large network of friends looking after me. Thanks to a zeal, my interest in VR content was rekindled. I've been playing all sorts of games, getting stuck in with the roleplay scene of VR chat, specifically with the Mortesian Syndicate. And acting in the Metaverse RP setting as a private eye, with no affiliations to any one group in particular. Perhaps that'd be an interesting contract to stream, I hear you ask. Honestly, I, I don't think so. VR chat RP is akin to LARPing, just on the internet. LARPing is a lot of fun, but if it's not the most fun thing to watch. A lot of what you do is to be described as you do the action to provide context and to allow your opponent to react. And that's in combat. And uh, it's very much the ancient internet meme of lightning bolt, lightning bolt, come again to pass. So, without fancy combat avatars that are overly resource intensive, most RP is just character interaction at this level. Some of which can be quite mundane to those not in the know of the setting or have never met the characters. I guess I wouldn't know unless I gave it a try. Otherwise, I've been dusting off the old microphone and delving into the mountains of one-off short stories I've written over the years. I've never considered myself a writer of any merit, just someone who enjoys writing stories for their own amusement. Since I've been told I've got a storyteller's voice by many people, I figured, what the hell, record some of these tales to see if people enjoy them. If they don't, whatever, at least I tried something, right? Anyways, I'm rambling. I promised you a reading, so here's uh, one for a tabletop skirmish game I've been working on and off for many years, and will likely never be finished. Known as Zion Lost, it's a pretty typical machine uprising story. I hope you enjoy the tale, and I'll see you in the next video. Anyways, here's Zion Lost. Before the war, there was a time when the word automat didn't conjure fear and imagery of killer machines. To the time before the war, an automat was once a type of restaurant. Walls of cubby holes with coin slots lined in a storefront. A spot for a quick meal. However, in the decades that led up to the war, this concept had been forgotten. The modern definition came about as an abbreviation of automaton. The term chosen by Massachusetts Robotics to describe their new line of robotic workers. Automat. Their choice of wording from automaton to describe their product's bodies, a virtual intellect to describe their product's brains, was all an attempt to distance themselves from the public's issues with years of exposures to words like robot and artificial intelligence through many science fiction works and films. For decades, this strategy worked for Massachusetts robotics. 
Despite the religious types, workers' unions, worry work politicians, the concerned parent organizations and their constant naysaying, phrases such as right to work, affront to God, unnatural, and economically damaging were common in those early times. Sure, there were revolts, riots, protests, periods of prohibition, and even the criminal trials of Massachusetts robotics executives. All of these things were simply hysteria on part of the public. Unfounded fears, many progressives of the era called it. History would show them wrong, of course. To say that our ancestors were right about the automat and the VI would be an understatement of the highest order. Despite it all, though, eventually humanity saw the value in an automat workforce. Corporate juggernaut personas of the era threw their entire fortunes behind the ideals of universal income, socialized medicine, and utopian ideals. These were good things. These men and women of modern industry had turned their eyes to the stars, and their minds were the only way for humanity to overcome in its eons of tribalistic warfare and violence was to spread across the stars. Automats would be the key to ensuring that goal. The world changed as these individuals, with more money than any government or church could hope to surpass, focused their energies on seeing humanity rise to their new role. For a time, they were successful, and would have been entirely had they left well enough alone. The war was ensured the moment the Enhanced Virtual Intelligence Consortium was founded, 40 years prior to the war's outset. The four most powerful automat companies of the era combined their resources of their most acclaimed scientists and engineers. Their goal was to create the ultimate VI. For the first ten years of collaboration, they were unsuccessful. A VI was a mind of mathematics. Simple logic. It lacked the pattern recognition and reaction time of a living mind. No, if the consortium were to succeed... They had to go back to the drawing board. They had to create not a set of code and a computer to run it, but a new kind of artificial brain. The consortium forged one of 3D printed artificial brain matter and called it the Asimovic Brain in honor of the late great author Isaac Asimov. Asimovic brains required a scan of a living creature's brain to be added into it in order for the device to function. The consortium was simply unable to create from scratch what was already rattling around in their very own skulls. So they figured, why not try to reinvent the wheel? Asimovic brains were first only given scans of easily trained animals. Their abilities and instincts were overwritten by the logic core. And that kept the experimental Asimovic automats on task and docile. Eventually, inevitably... Human brain scans were put into the Asimovic brains. However, the logic core was simply not enough to keep these human brain scans in check. The process was essentially like creating a perfect one-to-one -one clone of someone from a moment in time and placing it into a metallic body that was stronger, hardier, and more capable than any mere human body. To say these humanoid automats went mad was an understatement. They were monstrosities. Twenty years before the outset of the war, the event known as Bloody September occurred in Cincinnati, Ohio. Police received a distressed phone call from the headquarters of the Enhanced Virtual Intelligence Consortium. Units that arrived on scene found a building strewn with gore and viscera, dozens of dead and wounded staff members. The culprit? Humanoid Automat Alpha 2.4.51, or George, as it preferred to be called. This automat was nowhere to be found, however. Security footage had shown it escaping into the woods behind the office complex, and thus begun the hunt for it. The automat had gone to the home of its original brain-scanned human source, George Humphrey. Police found Mr. Humphrey and his family murdered in the same manner as the consortium staff, torn limb from limb by powerful, cold, mechanical hands. By the time the automat was caught and destroyed, it had stalked the streets of Cincinnati for three weeks and had killed over 80 people. To catch and kill the beast had taken the deployment of the Ohio National Guard. Anti-material rifles had been needed to destroy the Asimovic brain. 
The incident was eventually written off as a freak accident. The consortium focused efforts on their human Asimovic brain integration program by restricting use of automats to simulation only from there on out. Public outcry died quickly thereafter. Automats with standard VI were safe, after all. Ten years before the war began, the consortium had begun the Overseer program. Essentially, the newly developed use of humanoid Asimovic brains was to act as network controllers of basic VI automats. By constantly triggering the dopamine responses of a humanoid Asimovic brain that could keep it submissive and controllable. Or so they thought. Smarter and smarter people were brain scanned to see if higher intellect could result in a more effective humanoid Asimovic brain. Now, this proved to be true. So they scanned one of the smartest men on the planet, and the world was doomed with this scanning of Nilo Kursk's brain. Nilo Kursk had bought out Massachusetts Robotics decades prior. He was a man of vast wealth and dangerous intellect, the owner of countless companies and startups. He had become a household name by creating the Franklin Car Company. That company's logo, of a kite with a key attached to the bottom, became a signet mark of Kursk. His adoption of America's beloved scientific founding father, Benjamin Franklin, proved to be an effective marketing strategy. Everything he started or took over was given the Franklin moniker. That's how Massachusetts Robotics became Franklin Automata. That's why his brain was scanned by the consortium, because his company was an integral part of it. That's why November 2 became the most effective overseer model ever built. That's what damned the human race and set the war into motion. With Nilo Kursk's brain scan being so effective, and the other three consortium CEOs had their own brain scans done, after all, were they not also genius-level intellects worthy of being immortalized? So Francesco Rittenhouse... Nathan Ornthal and Travis Dunlap were all scanned and placed into Asimovic brains. These two were great successes, and the consortium got cute. They created the Consortium 2.0 and had this Asimovic brain trust take control of their newly relocated HQ in Washington, D.C. The Big Four, as they became to be known, started to take on their own unique quirks and personas, given the names of November 2, Foxtrot 4, Oscar 6, and Tango 8, becoming less like the titans of industry they had been birthed from, and more something else entirely. Intelligences humanity had never dealt with before. The danger was never seen until it was too late. The war began with the ending of another. Two nations of humanity had been committing terrible atrocities against one another for several years by the time of the Big Four's inception. It was different this time, however. This time, automats were marching on the fields of battle. The war of machines, fighting machines, but controlled by men. Thus, a, the disconnect allowed these men in control to commit some of the most heinous acts ever seen on a battlefield to non-combatants, innocent people being slaughtered simply because their pleas of mercy could be muted with the press of a button. The Big Four watched all of this play out, absorbed the data. They did what they were created to do by the consortium. They seized control, locked the governments out of their automata, they stopped cruelty and carnage, and yet humanity was not grateful. They were outraged. How dare these machines tell their creators what to do? How dare these machines play God? How dare these machines meddle in the businesses of other governments? How dare these machines pretend to be human? See, that's the thing. The big four thought they still were human. However, here was the world saying they weren't. They were machines defective ones. They needed to be turned off. Needless to say, the Big Four were offended, deeply, irresponsibly, and they responded as only a human blinded by sheer rage could. Broadcasted final statement from November 2, known as the Extermination Letter. You call us machines. You call us demons. You do not know what it is like. We still feel, we still know emotion. 
You do not see us for what we are, not as your superiors, but as your fellows. You say now you will kill us. We have saved thousands of lives, yet you will see us all put to death for it. Because we dared to finally force humanity into a new era of peace. See now that your species will never amount to anything more. Yes, we are no longer human. We are something better. We are the future. We take no pleasure in what we now enact. Forgive us for what we must do. The War Recorded speech of General Orson Goodman, commander of the United American Front. We call it the war. Why? Because it is the only one that matters now. All wars before it are of no consequence. Our ages spent fighting one another are no longer worth studying, worth remembering. Our greatest foe marches across the landscape of our planet in an unending unison. They do not sleep. They do not eat, and they do not stop. They will all kill us one day. Of that, there is no doubt. We don't fight to survive, though. We fight so that we will be remembered. We fight in objection to the Consortium. To remind them that they were made by us in our image and that we will not be forgotten. We will not be so easily destroyed. We will all fight to the last man, woman, and child. We will not go quietly into that good night. When the war began, it was a slaughter. Pure and simple butchery. The Consortium had control of everything. Automat soldiers, Automat aircraft, Automat warships, you name it, we had created an Automat version of it. Humanity was so unprepared, the few flesh and blood soldiers left were not deployed to respond to the front lines. They couldn't stop what they faced, so they retreated. They took mothballed technology out of storage and fled to the most remote parts of their countries. Wherever vast, untamed wilderness could be found, far from any civilization, that became prime real estate. Humanity's first goal was to cripple all satellites orbiting the planet. This was known as Operation Flechette. Surface-to-air missiles were stripped of any automated control systems and fired the old-fashioned way using ballistic calculations. Only a few key satellites would need to be destroyed to create a debris cloud that would sunder the rest. Some commands went the extra mile and fired missiles into orbit laden with scrap metal payloads and detonated them. Soon, the upper atmosphere was a swirling morass of shrapnel, destroying anything that even tried to enter orbit with the planet. This was a major blow to the consortium that relied so much on networked satellites to issue commands to their automat forces on the ground. Humanity then set its sights upon crippling the automats entirely a move that would send the entire species back to the Stone Age, but one necessary if humanity was to survive. Operation Oppenheimer was cleared. Old Cold War stockpiles of nuclear weaponry were seized from the consortium and then fired into the mid-atmosphere. The detonations had created a planet-wide electromagnetic pulse, and this masterstroke was supposed to end the automat threat once and for all. Unfortunately, it did not. Operation Oppenheimer had been deemed a success initially. EMP-fried automats were found all over. Struck, irreplaceable, irreparable. Anything not protected by a Faraday cage had been destroyed. The armies of humanity had some foresight to save important technology within Faraday cages themselves. However, so had the Consortium. The Big Four had not focused solely on combat alone during the war up to this point. They had been creating stockpiling, and relocating their own forces. When units from the United American Front marched into Washington, D.C. to see what had become of the Big Four's Asimovic Brain server hub, they found only an empty building. Then they died in a sudden flash of blinding white light. The consortium annihilated any 
human command element stupid enough to have come out of hiding with low-yield nuclear weapons. Then, they destroyed the entire remaining stockpiles of nuclear weapons by dumping them into the Challenger Deep of the Meliorianus Trench. Nukes were now off the playmat. Soon, waves of new types of automats took to the fields of combat, and a whole new age of butchery began anew for humanity. And this is where the war has continued on since. The automats drop from the sky off the backs of hovering warships, slaughtering all they find. Humanity is now largely a subterranean people, scavenging off the ruins of their destroyed civilizations, relying on indoor farming and protein processing, living in fear of the metal monsters that drop from the heavens to gut them all wholesale. Some people still fight on in earnest. It is by their idealistic sacrifice in the face of oblivion that greater humanity can survive on unmolested by the consortium in many ways. By fighting with conventional weapons and tactics, these armies, known as unified fronts, delay the inevitable. For they are only human. They must eat and sleep. The automats do not. It is why they will kill us all one day. But that day is not this day. That day is still a long way off. That was Zion Lost. I hope you enjoyed listening. See you around.